Well, welcome to uh, a Communitas podcast. This is a new experience uh, experiment we are trying with Communitas, and we'll see how it works. You can let us know what you think about it. But the idea is that uh, we would use this opportunity to supplement Sunday sermons, uh, partially, especially in a book like Exodus, where there's so much material, and we're trying to not keep the series going too long or have too long of sermons. And then also because sometimes after a sermon, people ask questions. We thought that one way to address some of those questions would be through a podcast like this. Uh, Also, it might be opportunities to talk some about more practical application of some of the things we talk about on Sundays. And to be honest, one of my goals for this is I just think it's good during the week For us to be reminded of the message, it's easy to forget from Sunday to Sunday what was said. And if in the middle of the week, it's an opportunity to remember what happened on the previous sermon, then that's another advantage of these podcasts. So welcome to this uh, new endeavor on the part of our church. Thank you for joining us. And for this first attempt at a podcast, uh, there's a particular question that John and I are going to talk about. It's good to have John uh, with us. Hopefully, a lot of times this can be a dialogue and not a monologue. But it's a question of uh, where we are in the story. And I've said in at least one or two sermons that it's important to remember where we are in the story. And I thought we'd just kind of tease out that idea a little bit. And so, John, my first question to you is, what does that phrase or question mean to you where we are in the story, and why is it important to remember where we are in the story? Well, I think whenever we're reading a book like Exodus, we're reminded that there are different characters that are important. Obviously, God is always the hero of the biblical story. Uh, There are human heroes that that arise. Some of them have names, like Moses. Um, There's a whole bunch of women that um, are involved in heroic activities in Exodus, And then lots of people that are simply nameless, but important. But we also are part of the story because it is our story. And the the story of God delivering his people is a story that funds our experience of what it means to be a delivered people rescued by God. Um, And I kind of thought about this in particular when Nenad was speaking about uh, Moses giving excuses uh, for, for, for not going um, uh, to um, take up the task of meeting Pharaoh, they are so often um, echoes of my own excuses, and probably everyone can relate to that. Um, so the, the, the reassurances, but also the reminders of our weakness, you know, place us very much in the story and address us in a very powerful way. Um. You talked about uh, in your sermon about God and, and, and the uniqueness of God and, and having a God worth worshiping. And, and a word that in my mind relates to that is, is holiness. Mm. Um, and so when you think about the, the book of Exodus, um, what are the particular ways in which holiness is communicated in Exodus that might actually contrast how, how that's developed later? Mm. Uh, so in, in, Exodus, what does holiness mean and how does God communicate that? Mm. I'm taken very much with the, the kind of image of the fire um, that is not consumed. Um, when, when Moses sees the bush um, aflame, but it's not burned up. Um, this idea of you know, a flame which is flickering and unpredictable, but, but, but constant, um, is a very powerful image to me of, of the holiness of God. This is something which is unique. You, you don't see anything like this um, anywhere else in, in the world. And, it, and it's a, an image that depicts God's character. And from the flame, he reveals his name, I am, I am. And it's kind of almost a kind of name that's not a name. Mm. It's kind of almost a name like saying, you know, um, it's almost like a dog chasing its tail kind of name, isn't it? That you, you, you never really get to the beginning or end of it. So here is a, um, an eternal flame, um, moving and unpredictable, never burning, and a name that is as, reveal- as mysterious as it is revealing. 
Um, so, you know, with with God, we we have someone that we know intimately, yet in knowing Him, we're kind of on the edge of a mysterious vastness that can be explored forever, which I, I, I guess is what I mean by a God that's big enough to worship. Well, that mystery is a good word uh, because of a question that, that arose from, from your sermon and the little incident uh, when, when Moses is with his family and they're traveling and then mm. God stops them and, you know, God is about to kill Moses. Mm. Uh, and so a question came up, at, you know, after the sermon, why was God so angry and why was God going to kill Moses? And I don't have a complete answer, but 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 my thought was where we are in the story, and especially in order to understand grace and other aspects of God's character, you know, we've got to understand God's holiness. Mm. And so that that was a, uh, I guess you can even use the word violent or almost violent mm. way for God to communicate the importance of who he is and he's different and, and, and no one, even God's called person, can treat God lightly. And so in, in my mind, that doesn't mean that God would necessarily do that for every character or at every stage in the story. Mm. But right at that moment, you know, Moses needs to get clear in his mind, this is who God is. Yep. Um, and so, you know, God, in a sense, plays his strong card. I, I mean, I, I use the analogy and I'm not completely comfortable with it. But years ago when I looked at a, worked at a Christian camp and we had a lot of kids and so forth, and and I had to do a lot of discipline things. Uh, and there are some times mm -hmm. when I I acted angrier than yeah. I really was sure. because I felt like I needed to to scare the kids up front, you know. And then once we established that, then actually the relationship could be normal. But they had to understand my position and the importance of, of, of the rules. Sure. And I, you know, I'm uncomfortable thinking about that as God doing that, but at least is, it is, is an example where there's times when, you know, we or God might act a certain way because it's important to communicate a certain message. Yes. Yes. And I, th I think that, um, you know, the idea that God is trying to kill Moses and what that looks like. I mean, the, the image I gave was that maybe it was like Moses trying to struggle through a force field um, and he, he felt he felt that there was this kind of massive resistance, and clearly they were not going to make progress until something was done. It reminds me rather a lot of the story of Balaam, um, when the donkey sees that there's an obstacle in the road, but Balaam doesn't. Um, and uh, and the kind of extreme measures that God goes to 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 get Balaam to see that he needs to obey. And of course, that's the point, isn't it? That God wants Moses to obey. And I think this probably does touch in, on the idea of where we are in the story, because not only did the burning bush um, reveal who God is, it also reminded Moses of who he was, because God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And of course, that brings us back to why circumcision was such an important issue. The defining mark of, of those three people was that they had been circumcised and Moses had not <clears throat> circumcised his son. So if he wants to stand within the story, he needs to embrace the mark of the story. Um, and that's why it's such a big deal. Um, you kind of think, you know, almost, almost it appears to be a minor thing. But, you know, um, if, um, you know, if the, the point of being uh, a child of Abraham is that you, you respect the covenant and you follow the God of Abraham, circumcision is part of the deal. I mean, I suppose in Latvia, for example, uh, if on one of those kind of important days of the year you don't put up the flag, you know it's going to happen. Yeah, we got a letter from the municipality saying there wasn't a flag in front of your house, fix it. <laughs> exactly, because it is a recognisable symbol that communicates the identity of the people in this country. And circumcision is the family of Abraham's sign that they are a distinctive people. Well, circumcision raises a, a further question about where we are in the story, mm. uh, because, of course, 
Now we don't think of circumcision as being required for God's people sure. and many other laws, including Sabbath laws. Mm. Uh, but sometimes when we raise that issue that, oh, that's temporary, then people think, wait, it's God's word. Mm. And, and so then that makes people uncomfortable to think that was, you know, there are some rules that are only for a particular part of the story and not for the whole story. Yes. Uh, so how would you interact with that that uh, idea? And and. Why are we justified in saying, no, that's temporary and then something else is eternal or sure. longer? Well, it's kind of the, the examples of circumcision and Sabbath, I think, are particularly interesting um, because they are markers which are given to this ethnic group, the children of Abraham, the physical children of Abraham. So circumcision, obviously well established. Sabbath um, is described in chapter 31 of Exodus as a sign between God and the nation. Um, so those are, those are the markers for their ethnic um, experiences, Israel, in relationship with God. What happens in the New Testament is that suddenly God's covenant spreads. It doesn't change from Israel to the church. There's not a replacement theology in the New Testament. But there is the idea that um, all those who become Christians become children of Abraham, according to you know Romans chapter four and Galatians three and so on. Now, because it is a now a wider group, that kind of distinctive ethnic sign is no longer appropriate, because there there are people who continue to be Jews, who continue with that marker even though they've not followed Jesus. So the marker continues but the marker transitions to something else. So circumcision transitions into baptism, Sabbath transitions into Lord's Day. And and that reminds us that we're you know we're related to the same God, but our experience is different and, and the way that we mark that experience is different. I guess probably every evangelist is pleased that they don't have to have the discussion immediately after someone has converted. Oh, by the way, you need to go to the medical center for a, a brief procedure. Um, um, one feels that it might be a snip too far for many people. Well, cold water baptisms here can be almost as bad. I guess so. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. We have heating. Yeah. Well, well okay. Then, then, then that I mean, you reference now when we come to the New Testament, you know, and so that's in terms of the story, where we are in the story, mm. you know, we are now after the coming of Christ. Yeah. And so without even, I'm sure, fully understanding all the dynamics that, that change, I, I do often want to, you know, want to say, but, but, but we now live after Christ. Christ mm. has come, mm. you know, and so in my mind, again, this is just my own way of processing it for instance people look at some of the old testament stories where you know the, the people of israel wiped out nations and they killed these people and maybe even god told them go kill these people and then that becomes a justification for well see they did that in the old testament that justifies this mm -hmm. behavior now mm -hmm. and, and i sometimes have said but we live after Christ now with the coming of, of Christ we we actually know more mm -hmm. Um, and, and so what, you know, what, what other differences would you say the coming of Christ? How, how does the coming of Christ change your perspective on history? Well, I, I think that the, the stories of, of people, you know, being killed um, as, a, as a result of conquest are difficult to deal with. And I, I, I think that, um, that there's a complex kind of story going on there. Um, if you go back to say something like Genesis 15, where it talks about the sin of the Amalekites reaching its climax, there is a sense in which um, the justice of God falls in the, the judgment on these different nations. And I think in some ways it kind of prepares us to understand the New Testament teaching concerning hell, um, however we describe that particular experience in the future. That there is there is a um, a justice of God, which will be met either through the cross or through um, judgment at the end of time. 
But I think that um, when we come to the New Testament, punitive death does not end. So Ananias and Sapphira experience punitive death. Um, we're told in 1 Corinthians 11 that some people who abused the Lord's Supper became sick and died. Um, and in 1 John, we're told that there is a sin unto death. Um, now, now, all of those are kind of tantalizingly brief and, 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 and leave as much unsaid as they say. Um, but, um, but they are, you know, relatively um, few references in the New Testament. The overwhelming message of the New Testament, for example, in Sermon on the Mount and Romans chapter 12, is that you, you, know, you, you seek to have mercy upon your enemy, you bless your enemy, um, you don't seek to crush them. Um, and the final judgment of those who oppose God will be at the end of time and not in our time. So we're, we're not to go killing the infidel. I mean, that's another example of where we are in the story. Yes. And, 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 it, and it's connected with, with Romans 12. Yes. You know, about the reason we don't need to pour down our own judgment is yes. because God will, as necessary, yes. God will do that. Yep. You know, and so we're not at that point in the story, mm. at our own point in the story. Sure. You know, this is how we relate to people, and we can do it with confidence again, yep. knowing. Uh, well, <clears throat> another way in which the where we are in the story I find useful is, you know, I've often said in, in sermons, we're between the cross and the resurrection, mm. and that the cross is now our pattern, you know, and so we, you know, the idea of sacrifice and, and a measure of suffering, we should expect now. Mm. Um, and you know, a lot of the, some of the blessings are for now, but some of the blessings are for the future. And when we try to take some of those future blessings and think, no, they're for now, mm. then we end up, you know, longing for the wrong thing. Mm. And because it usually doesn't come, we end up in a great deal of frustration. Mm. Yeah, you know, because somehow God isn't keeping His promises. Mm. Whereas in fact, it's just we're not remembering where we are in the story. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Mm. Mm. Well, these are just some reflections helping us to think through this theme of remembering where we are in, in the story, certainly in the book of Exodus. Uh, there are things that, that, that God does or demands of people that don't necessarily fill the story, but God is doing something in particular at that point in time to advance the story so that we can get to where we are now in the story. Thank you for joining us for this podcast.